but Russian troops are having to disembark from their armoured vehicles many more kilometres away because they don't want to be hit by these drones and, and advance on foot. So it's already changing Russian behaviour. And, um, you know, often these drones will cause damage to vehicles. They won't, they're, they're small explosives, so they won't always completely destroy a vehicle. But the, even that just disrupts, is enough to dis- disrupt an, a Russian attack and stop it. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with Maxim Tucker, an editor on the Times' foreign desk, who was Kiev correspondent between 2014 and 2016. Maxim has returned to report from the front lines of the war since Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. And we last spoke to him in December. Maxim, good to speak to you again. Thank you. Good to see um, you. Your most recent... Your most recent um, article is about how Ukraine is using first-person view drones in the war. Can you just start by describing exactly what they are and what their capabilities are? So a first-person view drone is is a a very small drone costing a few hundred pounds with a camera fixed to the front so that the pilot of the drone sees where the drone is going as if they were flying it themselves. Um, and they have been used to attach uh, small rounds of explosives, so up to kind of five kilograms max, normally about 2.5 to three kilograms, um, which are usually rocket propelled grenades, and they fly them directly into the weak points of enemy vehicles. So the Ukrainians are using them to, to target Russian tanks that would otherwise take, you know, 10 corrected fire artillery rounds to hit. And those artillery rounds are expensive and they're drying up as the West um, is unable to fulfill its ammunition orders. And where exactly are they carrying out these attacks? So they're carrying them out all along the front line. Um, They've been quite successful in the Kherson region using these first-person view drones. They're also using them a lot around Avdiivka, which is the most intense place of the fighting now on the front lines there. Um, But there are special units that move around and they basically try and look for uh, Russian attacks before they happen. And then they fly their drones up to 12, 15 kilometers beyond the Russian lines to hit um, Russian troops as they're massing attacks and hit the vehicles before the troops get out of them. It's been widely reported that they are being used to compensate for artillery shortages while Ukraine awaits more ammunition. So where are they making an impact and what are their limitations? So the good thing about them is they're, they're really cheap, they're very easy to produce. Um, you know, it's, it's about $300 to, to make these drones, whereas if you get an artillery shell now, because of demand, it can be anywhere up to £6,000. Um, so it's cheap, they're more accurate if you can use them properly. They're vulnerable because they're small um, to electronic warfare, so the Russians can jam the frequencies. Um, it's a big downside of it is that the Ukraine hasn't yet standardised munitions for these drones, so the soldiers use kind of whatever they can get, including sometimes homemade bombs, and a lot of the teams have found themselves blowing off hands or, or arms because they've they've had trouble with these explosives. So I think what Ukraine needs to do now is it needs to look at standardising munitions, and Zelensky has said that they will build a million FPV drones this year within Ukraine. At the moment, they get them mostly from China, but they want to build them inside Ukraine. But a, a big part of that will be making sure they have safe standardized munitions for the troops to use. And then they also will need to develop a protocol on how they can use these drones on the battlefield, because at the moment you have lots of drone pilots trying to queue up and find um, spots where they can fly these drones from, and they're interfering with each other's frequencies. They don't, sometimes don't coordinate attacks. So one one team who will be hunting a particular vehicle gets interrupted by another team, or another team hits the target that they were going for, and they have to adjust fire. And another thing is that although it's quite easy and quick to produce these drones, it's quite a lot harder to put, train good pilots. It can take months to train a good pilot, and even with the, the, with the schools that are training them now, it's only kind of in the hundreds that are being trained. Um, so they really drastically need to ramp up the the, the training of pilots, um, and then those tri- those pilots also need to to get used to working in battlefield conditions once they're trained. Because it's one thing to fly a drone in a school, and it's another thing to fly a drone um, when people are shooting at you. So who are these pilots exactly, and how are they recruited? So at the moment, it's it's been quite an interesting organic development. So it's a lot of special forces teams that have just have realised they can have more impact these ways. Um, they've been working with uh, foundations, there's a, and and volunteer groups who are fundraising for these drones because they're commercially available and mostly they're bought from from China, brought into the country. Um, and so just some teams who've realised that these are useful weapons have been using them and advocating for them to their commanders for the past year actually. And a lot of the pilots I spoke to said they were frustrated that. 
their commanders have been telling them, what are you doing with these toys? They're not effective weapons, you know, and then they show that they can actually take out hundreds of Russian vehicles using these drones uh, and they're cheap and they're effective. And, it, you know, you can use one drone to do what it would take a mortar squad an hour and, and 10 rounds to achieve. If they're able to strike uh, logistic supplies and affect troop movements, have you been able to get a sense of, of quite how effective they are in stopping Russia's offensive actions? They do look very offensive because, I mean, it, it, it's already changing Russia's tactics. So Russia is also beginning to use FPV drones, by the way. But Russian troops are having to disembark from their armoured vehicles many more kilometres away because they don't want to be hit by these drones and, and advance on foot. So it's already changing Russian behaviour. And, um, you know, often these drones will cause damage to vehicles. They won't, they're won't. they small explosives, so they won't always completely destroy a vehicle. But the, even that just disrupts, is enough to dis disrupt an, a Russian attack and stop it. And the groups who were using these drones and I, that I spoke to, she shared with me, because they're very keen on, on advocating how useful they are and getting more people to adopt them. They shared with me a spreadsheet of all of the kind of the strikes they've had. And you can watch the videos. So, you know, lots of lots of successful hits on targets. Um, other drones sometimes capture the impact of those. You know, you can get huge explosions if they hit the right bit on a, on a vehicle. Um, and, and yes, it, you know, these pilots are, are destroying hundreds of Russian vehicles each. So, you know, a handful of pilots that I spoke to had destroyed over a thousand vehicles. Do you get a sense of how many are being used on a daily basis? So it depends on, on how many they can procure and also the, the amount of rounds that they can get because even they say that even the RPG rounds that they attach to these drones are now in short supply and they really desperately need more rounds to use for these drones. Um, I think that any one team can use up to 20 to 30 drones a day. Um, they say they're only in the kind of hundreds of, of pilots. There aren't even thousands of pilots in Ukraine. Um, but Ukraine has said that it produced 50,000 drones in December alone. A lot of those are with Chinese components, but they're trying to move towards having more domestically produced components and being able to adapt the drones for use on the battlefield. At the moment, they're kind of commercially produced and then adapted. But Ukraine wants to, to build drones that are specifically for battlefield use. You mentioned earlier um, the trouble sometimes you have um, in terms of the frequencies in using these drones. I mean, can you just explain a bit more about that uh, and how coordinated it is in terms of selecting targets and how, how it's all conducted on the battlefield at the moment? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the nature of this warfare is, is really interesting because you have, as, as ever in war, you have fast electronic advancements or fast advancements in weaponry. Um, and you have these drones which are being developed and used and deployed in new ways but then the russians are also learning to counter them they first they, they're buying up fpv drones but they're also producing better electronic warfare capabilities so at the beginning of the war russia had kind of really huge vehicles which were jamming um ukrainian frequencies but they were big targets and you can see them and, and over the, the the course of the war these um uh, electronic warfare things have, devices have got smaller and smaller and so now they kind of increasingly see russian troops with with handheld devices ukrainian troops too anti-drone guns which can which can bring down these drones or even take over control of the drones and redirect them um so that's that's going to be an increasing problem and, and drone manufacturers will will We'll have to find a way to produce more sophisticated equipment that can deal with jamming. I think at the moment what the Ukrainian pilots do is they try to switch to frequencies that are not being jammed. They can see on their screen when they get close to electronic interference and they might have to move and dodge and try and find another way to get to the, the target that they want to hit. So there's quite a lot of skill involved for the pilots in, in understanding not only where you're going with this drone, um, but also keeping an eye on the, the, the different um, frequencies and the different jamming effects um, and also they're trying to coordinate using an app to have a look at what other targets are available if they have to reroute because another team has already hit it but there there still isn't a fantastic degree of coordination between these teams because it hasn't been synchronized by the army officially and the army is, is quite slow and bureaucratic and has been not as fast as the volunteer groups in, in catching up with these new developments but there is a sense now that the army is going to absorb this and make this officially part of the training is that right so the government is very keen on it. Um, Zelensky has made this pledge to have a million drones and, and the Minister um, for Strategic Industries says we're going to produce these domestically. So obviously that means that there is a command from on high that these, these, these are things that are useful and they should be used. Um, and that's going to take some time to, to filter down through the army. It's, it's still kind of pretty bureaucratic in, in Ukraine's army. And 
developing the protocol and things. That's all stuff that they say has been worked on in the Ministry of Defence. Um, we have a new defence minister in Ukraine as well, who is is, is quite um, progressive and forward looking. So I'm sure he, he's going to be looking at this. Um, but it will all it will all take time, and Ukraine doesn't really have time. So that's one of the struggles that they're trying to address by through these volunteer groups and procuring large numbers from China. But presumably, a million, if they are produced this year, could make quite a difference. A million drones would, would make a huge difference. Um, you know, the, the, the question will be, how do they use them? Do they have enough pilots to fly them? Um, where are the pilots going to be operating from? How skilled those pilots will be? Uh, how many drones it takes to get a, a pilot up to speed and, and hit a target? Um, so those are all, and the, and the coordination of it. And, you know, part of the other limitation is this, is that although they can fly kind of 10, 15, 20 kilometers, they normally need to be on raised ground because they're limited by the radio horizon. Um, and that means, you know, often they're in an exposed spot. Um, they can be targeted by Russians. There's Russian, you know, FPV drone pilots who are specifically targeting the Ukrainian FPV drone pilots. Um, so it's a, it's a dangerous profession and there's a lot of people trying to go to the same kind of places in order to fly their drones. So that's something that the army will need to solve as well. I think you, I think you wrote in your piece that these, these pilots are actually very high value targets for the Russians. That's right. I mean, you know, if they are kind of, if you consider them the aces who have taken out kind of hundreds of, of Russian army vehicles, that might be soft top, that might be armoured. Um, the value is 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 really serious, and, and some of these pilots are a lot better than than other pilots. You know, the ones who've been doing it for a long time and are really proficient, and they're getting called on all the time to stop Russian offensives and stop Russian attacks. So there's a, a premium on them within the Ukrainian army, and the Russian army has recognised that and is is trying to target them whenever they see them. You mentioned the kind of injuries that some of the pilots have had um, in trying to set their drones up. Uh, how organised and how developed is the training for these pilots? It's getting better. I think at the beginning, you know, some of the first adopters of, of this, the first pilots said they basically had this thing as a toy, as a reconnaissance drone, and then they realised actually this can be a really useful weapon. And they started training themselves in their spare time um, and they, they developed their skills kind of organically and then they were trying to show that this was a really useful tool to the rest of the army. It was taking time. Now Ukraine does have, um, largely thanks to volunteer groups actually, training academies um, if, in flying FPV drones and so those are NGOs that are set up to, to try and train troops um, in the best way of using them. Um, Ukraine will obviously now need to institutionalize that if it's going to have a million drones it's going to need to have a lot of pilots to fly them so it's going to have to take into a, its own hands the training and, and not just be done by NGOs but as a lot of stuff has been done in this war it's, it's really been volunteers uh, volunteer groups and kind of people who are former military or people who are in from society with some kind of engineering background who want to help the country who've done something to to, to make the army progress um, and now the army is having to catch up and when you were in Ukraine in December, how aware were you by the dangers posed or the threat posed by Russian uh, first-person view drones? So there's been a lot of talk about Lancet drones. So these are the kind of Russian mass-produced drones, and they're, and they're bigger and heavier, and they're, they're kind of um, designed by the military in order for military use. Um, and they have been pretty successful in, in targeting um Ukrainian vehicles and you, you could see the damage that they were doing on the battlefield especially because they have much larger warheads than these these homemade drones so there's a lot of people talking about how dangerous lancets are and how to avoid being caught by lancets um, so a lot of people were talking about the impact of that so yes they're on on the Russian side they're using these as well um, and they because of the size of the country and the scale of the industry they're able to scale those up much more and also they're buying not FPV drones but different kinds of kamikaze drones from Iran and they're producing um, Iranian design drones now inside Russia. I, I heard anecdotally that one of the, the greatest risks um, for a, a person like perhaps yourself on the front line from these drones is that um, if they're sent out and they're a kamikaze drone, uh, first person view drone, they don't actually find their target that they'll just go for anything on the way back rather than come back empty hand and do nothing. Right. Yeah. No one really wants to be landing a, a drone with an explosive payload on, on your side of the line. So they do tend to look for another target. Um, and that makes it dangerous to be traveling near the front line in any kind of vehicle. And there have been um, there, ha there was a journalist crew that was hit in their vehicle um, by by a drone. So that, that is a, a risk for anyone traveling near, near the front line. Um I mean, in terms of the targeting, um, did you get a, a sense of the organization of the targeting by the Ukrainians? 
So you can you can see they have um, quite an advanced system on on their tablets where they have uh, you can pull up multiple drone feeds. You can see the reconnaissance drone feeds, and they can select targets from there. And they, certain teams and certain units and battalions will share their streams with other teams and units and battalions. So there is some kind of coordination, but it's it's normally done in a kind of like many things in Ukraine on a networking basis. So who you know and what other teams you follow and you know who you've been in touch with, um, and it doesn't seem to be done at a very kind of controlled hierarchical level at the moment. So that's something that Ukraine will need to develop. But uh, there is some sharing. There's definitely the technology to do it. Um, they can pick targets and, 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 and communicate how they're picking those targets using these applications that they have. Um, but it gets quite difficult to manage when you're talking about something on the scale of a million drones and, and the, you know large quantities being used every day. And how is Ukraine defending itself against Russia's FPV drones? Because its its electronic warfare, as I understand it, is deemed to be less effective than that of Russia. Well, they've got less money to spend on it, um, and you know they have. It's difficult for them to build um, their own electronic warfare devices because of the constant attacks by Russia. But I think that's something that we've seen in, in Zelensky's New Year address. He was really determined to say, "Okay, look, actually, our Western partners are not necessarily as reliable." as we thought they were. So Ukraine needs to step up and produce its own weapons and manufacture its its own um, electronic warfare devices. And so that's something Ukraine is, is going to be trying to do. And, and um, it's going to be really important for Ukraine this year. But that still does depend to a large degree on the air defenses. So Ukraine is be able to kind of start making these long term economic plans because Western supplied air defenses have been quite good at defending its cities and shooting down Russian cruise missiles. Um, with you know the US stalling its its aid to Ukraine, which includes you know normally there's a lot of anti-aircraft missiles included in those packages, um, and the EU struggling to fulfil the quotas it said it would supply to Ukraine, that's going to be a, a worry for Zelensky. And, and you know Zelensky in fact said it's going to be impossible for Ukraine to survive if both the EU bill and the US bill are continue to be held up. You mentioned earlier that um, these FPV drones are being bought from China. Russia's doing the same. Um, it being the number one manufacturer of, of them, how did the industry actually start and develop? So it's a, it's a commercial industry. DJI is the, is the kind of the, the, the foremost um, producer in, in China. Um, and they have, uh, I think the, the, the main guy, Frank Wang, who's the head of DJI, said he was playing with a, a toy helicopter and he got frustrated with how it kept breaking down and wanted to improve it himself. So that, that's the kind of story of the development in, in China. Um, and these things, you know, they were selling maybe a thousand drones a month before the war. And, you know, now that the Ukrainians and the Russians are buying them, it's they're producing, kind of selling 20 to 1,000, 30,000 um, a month. So, you know, huge numbers of drones and they know what they're being used for. I mean, obviously they're commercially available. They're not attached to munitions. Um, but I think they know who their customers are. And actually, the last time I was in Ukraine, I was very interested to see a kind of huge DJI store in Kiev with big, big drones there. And, you know, obviously they're targeting the Ukrainian Russian um, markets very vigorously. How do you, um, I, I was reading from the Institute of Study of War, they were talking about um, Russia and Ukraine being sort of locked in this kind of race now, almost like a technology race uh, to see who can get the upper hand. And you have Ukraine relying on these drones sort of almost as a kind of, I don't know if it's like the correct way to describe it, but almost like a DIY kind of alternative to coping while it's waiting for air superiority. How important do you think this technology race is at the moment when you see this war being in, in a situation where it's, it's, it's largely positional and there's not an awful lot of progress on either side. Yeah, I think, you know, that, and that's what General Zeluzny was saying when he, he wrote that economist piece uh, a few months back, is that the wars reach a stalemate. You know, it's, it's largely trench warfare. There's very heavy fortifications on both sides. They've had a lot of time to, to lay mines and build trenches and, and uh, reinforce um, bunkers. So it's, it's difficult in conventional warfare to, to, to make a move across this. Um, one of the ways that they can, can make advances, especially on the Ukrainian side, because they're really concerned about losing manpower, is, is use of drones and, and robotics as well. The Ukraine is also developing different robots that can advance onto the battlefield um, and you know mount weapons on them and without having uh, any form of human involved in the front lines to keep them safe. So those kind of things are things that the Ukrainians are desperately looking at because they know that they are at the moment outgunned by Russia. Um, you know, there is still a, a, a possibility that, you know, especially if, if the West doesn't supply Ukraine with the ammunition it needs, that Russia, through its kind of sheer force of numbers, 
you know, great bigger country, bigger industry can just overwhelm Ukraine. I think they've still got that on their side. Um, but Ukraine, for Ukraine, it's it's really important to fight an asymmetric war where they're lo- taking less casualties and they can employ technology as much as possible. And Ukraine, obviously, is at pains to try and develop its own industrial production, its defence industry. What signs are you seeing of that? So, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting development that Zelensky is talking about, a million drones. It's very interesting that the ministry is saying we're now going to take over the domestic production of those, particularly when it's so easy to buy Chinese drones. But it's a recognition about the strategic importance of, of that industry. Um, the, the rhetoric is all there. Uh, all the ministers and the, and the, and the government are, are saying we need to do this. You also see some signs of development with, you know, international companies like Rheinmetall and BAE Systems actually going into Ukraine and saying we're going to have en- engineers who can uh, repair vehicles or repair systems inside Ukraine and exchange know-how inside Ukraine. So that will be very important for Ukraine's development. Um, But it's still quite early days, I would say, you know, Ukraine for the first two years has kind of been in survival mode, then then hoping for its offensive. Um, And now it's only setting in that this is going to be a really long war and we need to prepare for it accordingly. And part of those preparations is making sure that it has the strategic industries in place to produce arms. And just finally, Maxim, um, last time we spoke, we were talking about the bridgeheads that are being created by Ukraine on the left bank of the Dnipro River. And I'm hearing kind of conflicting reports on on exactly what's happening there and and who is making the gains. Are you able to give us any update? Yeah, you you get very conflicted reports now on on what's happening. Um, There are some good news for Ukraine in that, you know, they reported shooting down three Su-34 bombers over the Kherson region. Um, and those bombers had really been hammering the Ukrainians who had got across the river. And, and there was a lot of complaints from Ukrainian Marines about the damage that those bombs were doing. Um, so obviously, Ukraine had moved some powerful anti-aircraft system, likely a Patriot missile system, down to, to cover the troops in that area, which could make a difference. But, you know, all the people that I was speaking to before say that there are a lot of casualties on the Ukrainian side from people going over. It's very tough fighting. Um, they were they were upset that they, when they had originally crossed, they didn't make a breakthrough and they felt that there should have been a, a kind of more aggressive push there. Um, but Ukrainian Southern Command is still saying we are advancing, we are making ground. The Russians are blogging and saying that, you know, the Ukrainians are being driven out. So it's, it's very difficult without spending more time there to say what's exactly is happening on the ground right now. I guess you'll be going back soon. Maxim Tucker, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Kate. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. If you'd like to subscribe, you can hit the button now or you can listen to Times Radio or go to thetimes.co.uk. My thanks to our producer today, Louis Sykes, and to you for watching. Bye-bye.